It's, um, it's really great to be back here, and particularly with such a fantastic conversational partner. But um, before we start talking, I'm going to tell you a story. And the title of the story is How I Met Mike. It was, remember? Oh, oh I do. I do. <laughs> big, big moment in both our lives. It was um, back in 2007, and the World Wildlife Fund had released a somewhat scandalous report in which they graded, like in school, the top 10 largest luxury companies in about 50 different areas of CSR. And no one got higher than a C plus. Two failed, and Tiffany got a D plus, which actually put it sort of in the middle. So needless to say, the subjects of this were not really happy because I decided to write about it. And um, to be fair, it was a pretty flawed report, mostly because of a lack of information. So after my story came out, I got a call saying, Tiffany would like you to come in and talk to our CEO. I was like, OK, that'd be fun. It was like going to the principal's office. And uh, so I walked in, and there was, there was Mike Kowalski. And he proceeded to tell me about the fact that Tiffany did not use new coral in any of its jewelry because coral reefs were not sustainable. Tiffany did not buy new rubies because rubies were impossible to assure origin. And, um, and that you source most of your gold from a very specific mine in Utah where the employees are unionized and the environmental effects are measured. So I said, well, that's pretty good. Why didn't you tell anybody? And you said, do you remember? No, I don't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Not specifically. <laughs> and, and he said, Why well, you, you said, um, the problem with talking about what you do mm -hmm. in the environmental space when you're a luxury brand is as soon as you put your head above the parapet, someone takes like a big thing of mud and flings it at you for all the things you don't do. And so we want to have a very long track record that we can talk about before we expose ourselves to the mud flingers. But I sort of feel like right after that meeting, you actually started talking. And in a lot of ways, you haven't entirely stopped. So has it, did anyone see the New York Times on Tuesday? Raise your hand. Anybody? Come on. <laughs> you sus subscribe. <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, real news is under threat. You've heard this. Um, well, anyway, I, for those who did not see it, have brought page three. And in case you can't see this, we're going to show it. Can we see page three? OK, this is an ad that Tiffany took out. We're still in. Dear President Trump, we're still in for bold climate action. Please keep the US in the Paris Climate Agreement. The disaster of climate change is too real, and the threat to our planet and to our children is too great. <laughs> so, uh, so why did you do that? <laughs> um, Vanessa, of course, is correct. We, um, for many years, we've been deeply engaged in um, moving the company toward a more sustainable future, or at least a more responsible future. When you talk about sustainability in mining, you need to be very careful because at the end of the day, we are, we are mining depletable resources or using depletable resources. But we did, over the years, realize that uh, we were probably um, hiding our light under too thick a bushel, and that if our customers, um, our customers care deeply about this, we believe that our customers care deeply about it. Um, and we always believe that responsible behavior was an implicit part of the Tiffany brand promise, and therefore talking about it really wasn't necessary. Obviously, our point of view has changed, and with respect to this ad, I, I think um, our motivation was very simple. I think if, if any government or, or your government um, begins to deny the, um, the unequivocal signs of climate change and, and the ramifications for um, human health and welfare. And if you are a company that um, is committed or even claims to be committed um, to responsible behavior, I really think you, you have no option but to speak up one and, and to act. And uh, as we knew that the president was preparing to make a decision this week, which I understand has since been postponed, make a decision <laughs> about other, other, other issues, uh, <laughs> make a decision about uh, 
withdrawing or remaining in the Paris Climate Accord, um, we thought it was simply the appropriate time. And again, for us, it's not new. I mean, many years ago, we withdrew from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to protest their climate policy or their lack of climate policy. Um, after the November elections, uh, we, and along with many, many other U.S. industries, uh, companies wrote to the president uh, asking to reconsider the position on, on Paris and climate. And again, this most recent example. And uh, so we've, we've, it's been something that we've had on our agenda for a long time. It's not a, not a recent discovery on our part. And what was the reaction to the ad? Um, the reaction was interesting. Most importantly, um, our, um, our employees, our colleagues, um, were extremely pr proud. Um, hundreds of, of emails to me thanking uh, the company for taking such a bold step. Um, most customers were happy. There were some, there were some dissent. Um, Did some you get people tweet? <laughs> no, we didn't get a tweet. <laughs> no tweet, not yet. Um, we were, um, uh, we, uh, we were, the, the, the most um, typical response was, you shouldn't be involved in politics. And uh, our response was, this isn't politics, this is science. And if someone else chooses to make climate change a political issue, that's their problem, not ours. And that again, if, if we are true to what we believe, um, and many other companies as well, who joined us in, the, in an, also a, a group message in the Washington Post in the uh, Times on Monday, then again, I think you have no choice but to speak out. Because mm -hmm. President Trump is a Tiffany client, right? He is he, indeed. He's, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, we're neighbors, of course, uh, on 57th and 5th. And uh, uh, we've, he's known the company well over the years. <laughs> so yes, he is, at least for the moment, yes. Do they try to buy you? <laughs> no comment. Okay. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how your policies in the environmental, you know, area have evolved since 2007, you know, grown or changed? Sure. You know, I, I think if I can go back a little bit before 2007, because I think for us, um, conflict diamonds, blood diamonds in 1999-2000 uh, really was, was the singular wake-up call. And at that point, we recognized that uh, although we ourselves did not mine diamonds or gold or silver or anything, um, that we had to understand precisely how those uh, commodities came to be. Um, we began vertical integration. Uh, right now, um, we manufacture most of what we sell, um, manufacture it largely in the United States, um, and we are vertically integrated backward right up to the mine. Um, so our objective, our objective was to, to fundamentally understand that chain of custody, uh, that chain of supply, make sure that it was absolutely transparent, and, and the difficult part was, and then to begin to try to influence mining. Again, we are a famous brand. Um, we have uh, certain credibility. We're a trusted brand. But at the end of the day, uh, Tiffany is not a major player in terms of world diamond usage or, or world gold usage. So that we realized that we really needed to use the, um, um, if I may, the moral power of the brand as a, uh, as a persuasive tool and have begun to uh, advocate strongly for great, greater responsibility at the mine level. Um, again, we've become involved in climate change. Um, we're very much involved in, in the protection of U.S. public, US public lands from, um, from mine exploitation. Uh, we've opposed many gold mines in pla places that we felt were simply inappropriate, Bristol Bay, Alaska being the most famous. Uh, and in general, simply to your point a moment ago, we've simply begun to speak more boldly about this because oddly we've been criticized Yours was an observation. We've been criticized for, again, doing so much and speaking so little about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about you know, what you're doing in the area of responsible mining, because we had a lunch, it was about a, a, two years ago, a year years and a half ago, ago yeah. where you were about to retire. Yes. And you retired and then you unretired. I did. Um, but yeah. you, you said that, that you were going to use your retirement and your position as the, the non executive chairman of Tiffany's to really you know, focus on responsible mining and, and sort of lobbying the industry. So, how far did that go? Um, well, I, you know, I think we're making progress. Um, one of the things that uh, Tiffany has been working on for 10 years or longer uh, is a set of stronger mining standards um, for. 
um, the industry as a general. Now, once again, in general, once again, we are not miners, but we certainly have influence. And the jewelry industry is, of course, a major user of, of so much mine material. So we've been working with um, some other end users, um, some electronics companies, one or two mining companies, to create um, what we believe is a true th third-party standard uh, system of, of stan uh, excuse me, certification system. And by third party, I mean a system where it's civil society, uh, industry, and, um, and, and the NGO community and governments work together and they have a role in governance of a certification system. What the industry has now is not quite there yet. It's a, it's a two-party system with, without formal participation by, by civil society and others. So we'd very much like to see that happen. And we'd also like to see a set of standards that are aspirational, that are not least common denominator, but in fact move the ball forward in a dramatic way. And we're, we're, we're getting some traction. Uh, it'll be, it's gonna be a long haul. It's, a, it's challenging, but we're, uh -huh. we're making progress. Standards like what? I mean, can you actually go through Sure. You know, um, and are there numbers attached? Sure. I'll, I, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but you know, there's a question of uh, mine tailings. Um, how, do, how does one dispose of mine waste? Um, should there be an outright prohibition against um, marine or riverine tailings disposal? I know I'm already boring some of you, <laughs> but the question is, you know, what, what is an appropriate place? And, and right now we believe that marine and riverine tailings disposal should not be allowed. Uh, we can talk about parts per billion of cyanide released into the uh, into the in, into the waters, but but that's uh, that's that's even more boring. I think probably the most interesting topics are are in a sense the easiest. Where not to build a mine? You mm -hmm. know, where are the places that mining should never ever be allowed, regardless of how safe or how um, sustainable or or or. or However good you can make that mine, should there be certain places Where? that have such high ecological or cultural value, Bristol Bay, Alaska is, is one, which, which sadly right now, um, it had been, um, the mine had been stopped. We thought it was dead, and now, of course, it's been revived under a different uh, political environment. So once again, battle lines will be drawn to try to stop um, the pebble mine in Bristol Bay. But I think those are probably some of the highlights. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've, we've heard a lot about the circular economy and circularity this morning. Is that something that applies to jewelry? Because I don't really think of jewelry, particularly fine jewelry, as necessarily having an, an end life. I mean, I, you know, like I, most of the jewelry I own came from my grandmother, mm -hmm. you know, and went to my mother and, you know, and I will pass it on. I mean, my children sit there and look at it and say, oh, I want that or I want that. So I'd be like, how do you think about circularity? Well, you know, I think that's a, that's, that's a fair point when we, when we think about um, closed system circularity. I wasn't quite sure what circularity was a few moments ago, but uh, in, our, in, our, in our industry, you're right, an argument can be made that 99% um, of the gold and 99.99% .99 of any diamond that's been mined is still in existence and still in use today. Um, when we think about carbon footprint, mm -hmm. certainly mining has a significant carbon footprint, but if you think about that carbon footprint over the lifetime of, of your earrings, um, it becomes a very different story. So we, we do think a lot about that. We, we, um, we heavily depend upon recycled materials for gold, platinum, and silver. Um, I don't know the numbers, but they're significant. Uh, and, and clearly, diamonds, um, forgive me, De Beers, but they, they, they are forever, and, uh, and, and, they, you know, and they continue to have value, hopefully. They don't, they don't end up in landfill. They don't end up in landfills, yeah. Be a good place to look. Um, so, what, I mean, do people bring their jewelry back into Tiffany's? Do you take it back if someone wants um, to? We don't do that, but you we'll don't. redirect them to the, to the appropriate place. What, why don't you? Um, I think the, 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 the uh, previously, I was about to call it the second-hand jewelry market, the previously owned um, jewelry market is, is a difficult place to operate. Um, it's simply um, fraught with, with legal and, and value uh, questions that we simply choose not to become involved in. Mm -hmm. It's more of a business decision than a, uh, simply it's not a, it's, it's tough to, it's a very, lo it's a very low margin business mm -hmm. at the end of the day, buying your second hand jewelry. <laughs> Um, but you have people who do that you will read that you trust sure, absolutely, and absolutely. customers yeah, and too. of course the auction houses most mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. yeah. so what do you think are the biggest challenges facing you know the jewelry sector in terms of, of sustainability I think ultimately um, you know the the, 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 the sustainability uh, issues are in in 
in the industry ultimately revolve around mining. I mean, I think when you, or, or however one chooses to source, um, whatever material you're choosing to source. 10 years ago, I would have said conflict diamonds or blood diamonds were, um, were a, you know, a, an existential threat to the industry. Um, through a lot of good work at the, uh, at the behest of governments and certainly the, the, the strong participation of the NGO community, um, I think that problem is largely behind us. I, I pick a number, but it's probably well over 99% of the world's diamond are now mined in a, in a responsible way. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about diamond mining, um, unlike gold mining, for example, di the environmental Im footprint of diamond mining, excuse me, of diamond mining is relatively benign. Um, there's not a lot of chemical processes involved. The footprint tends to be small. It's a kimberlite pipe. Mm -hmm. um, those issues, we know how to build and, and operate, and we do, folks do build and operate very responsible uh, diamond mines and socially both in, and environmentally uh, sound mines. Gold, diamond, uh, gold mining is a bigger challenge. Um, as, as gold becomes scarcer and scarcer in the environment, um, we're forced to go to places that are more and more remote. Uh, perhaps of greater and greater ecological or cultural value. So I think um, the, the future supply of, of, of gold in particular um, is going to be, I, I would call that out as the singular uh, greatest challenge in the industry. And then the other challenge in the industry is just a willingness to just walk away from certain things. We walked away from coral uh, in 2002. It's incomprehensible to me why any jewelry company would sell red and pink coral today, given the threat that it poses to coral reefs, and yet most folks go out doing it. Um, there's, nothing, um, there's, there's nothing more helpful for a company trying to be responsible than to have um, activist NGOs on your left flank. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the jewelry industry could use more of that, actually. Um, OK, you guys, you got yeah. that? Something to do. Um, I mean, to that end, do you think that this is something that's really been taken on board by your peers, you know, by the rest of the industry? Because I do get the sense sometimes that, you know, luxury, particularly the luxury end of fashion and jewelry, feels almost like it's got a kind of pass mm -hmm. in this area because, you know, they say, oh, we make these products, they're beautiful, they're meant to last, people keep them, we don't have those problems. Yeah, and, and that's exactly why, I, you know, we've, we've made the assumption that, this, that, that all this is, a, this is an implicit part of the Tiffany brand promise. And I think the, more interest, the, the interesting question related to that, we could responsibly source everything. We could, respond, we could source all our diamonds, for example, from Canada. And Tiffany could do that, and it would be very nice, and then we would have a very clean mm -hmm. um, uh, statement about sourcing of diamonds. But the implication of that is, do, I th do we throw the entire African continent under the bus? And the, the, the incredible importance that diamond mining has for so many countries in Africa, like Botswana and, and Namibia. So I think that... Um, and I forgot, what, what was the question? I, I got off on a tangent. Whether, whether the rest of the jewelry industry Whether the rest of the industry. This, yeah. So, so I, I think there, there's, there is a sense that luxury companies can take a pass because we still are a relatively small part of the, business, uh, of the industry. The interesting question is what, what business imperative and secondly, what moral imperative is, do we have to step beyond our four walls and say, fine, we can fix this for Tiffany. But you know, we're a leader in the industry, we have credibility with consumers, we're trusted, we're loved, et cetera, et cetera. Don't we have to step out and try to, try to extend our influence beyond our own brand for the greater mm -hmm. good? So are you gonna do anything to that end beyond the, you know, the, the advertisements and lobbying your peers? I mean, what's coming? Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, one quick question sure. before we end, because we're out of time. Um, this comes in two parts. Okay. Uh, first, what is the biggest mistake you made during your sustainability journey? And, um, and second, if you were gonna leave everyone in this room with one lesson that you learned, what would it be? Um, probably the sustainability, the, the error was where we began this conversation, probably not speaking um, mm -hmm. as loudly and as boldly as, as we might have had um, license to um, early on. The second question, one lesson or one? If you had to leave everyone here with a lesson. You know, I, I think that for us, in order, to, in order to face issues of sustainability or responsibility in your supply chain, you have to be willing to stare down the, the um, unpleasant realities of your, of your supply chain. You can't hide from them. 
and you know, consumers on one level don't care much about gold mining, and they don't really want to know about cyanide leaching. But in order, in, order, in order to do the right thing to a certain degree, you have to pull back the veil and expose your flaws to consumers who care. And if you do that, then you can move forward from a position of power and confidence. If, if you try to hide behind, behind just because the consumer doesn't care or doesn't seem to care, then I don't think you can really move forward. Okay, there you have it. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mike Kowalski.